Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. We have a very eventful night for you this evening, a very prophetic segment of our broadcast of Israeli News Live. And uh, I just want to quickly uh, share with you something that uh, was shared with me today. Um, there was a, uh, I say today may have been yesterday, I get hundreds of emails in, so it's hard for me to keep up with everything, but a precious friend sent us uh, an article regarding Ethiopia. There's been 50 more people uh, this week that have been killed in clashes there in Ethiopia around Adidas Abababar. And of course, the whole reason for it is, is the expansion of the capital, uh, making way for the progress of the uh, natural gas that has been discovered in the country, the pipeline being built. Uh, of course, the Vatican owning a huge amount of stocks in the company, Gulf Oil, that's also a part of this project there. Uh, we, we, we have Gulf uh, or either, it's either Gulf or Shell. They own stock in both of the companies, International, uh, Ethiopia as well. Um, and just very interesting to say the least things that are going on there. Again, this is from Daniel's prophecy, chapter 11, where it says Egypt and Ethiopia would be at his steps, speaking of the Vatican. Uh, so anyway, let's move on to uh, other news here that I wanted to bring to your attention here uh, as well. And we are looking, of course, those of you that already are aware, uh, uh, President Vladimir Putin, who is in Syria, been defending the, uh, the uh, uh, President Bashar al-Assad al uh, in this whole world coming up against uh, Bashar al-Assad. Now, we're going to go into very deep detail about Bashar al-Assad's family, how they came to power, etc. Uh, and also, we're going to be looking at Vladimir Putin. There is a interesting passage that the Lord put on my heart today that I want to share with you that's going to surprise you. But keep in mind, this is a compound revelation. It's got different angles and different twists to it, to say the very least. If you're going to be following in your Bibles, we're going to be looking at three different prophecies uh, from three different books in the Bible. We'll be looking at 2 Kings chapter 5. We'll be looking at... Um, uh, the book of Nahum, chapter 2. And we're also going to be going again back to Daniel, chapter 11. And in fact, let's just get started right now um, uh, on Daniel, chapter 11 there. A very, very fascinating passage, to say the least, there that I want to share with you. Uh, and uh, so let's go right there. And... We're looking here, Daniel chapter 11 there. I didn't, wasn't actually thinking about doing this quite first there. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, I believe we're looking right around verse, uh, what was that, verse 14, I believe it is. And um, yes, verse 14 right here. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the children of the violent among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. Um, we shared with you the other day the, 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 the translation of this, how it really actually comes out in Hebrew. It's right there on your screen there. Uva pratsi amcha. It's Daniel's people, so it's the Jewish people. And it says, the sons of the lawless, of your people, Daniel. They're going to... Uh, uh, Yinasu, uh, which is they're going to marry Laha Amiyad Hazon. They're going to marry the vision. This is why it says they established the vision. In other words, they're trying to bring together biblical prophecy. And it would be the lawless of Israel that would do this. And I really begin to sit down and meditate on these things today. And I've been looking at this, and I actually feel like that we can go back even at the beginning, even before the beginning of the creation of the state of Israel, back in 1948 when she became a nation. And, uh, and the reason why I say that is because the Vatican was looking for a new way to take over this country. Uh, the Turks had had it, the British had had it. Uh, and, and, of course, it was in British control at that time there. Then we had the British mandate that set up a state of Israel and also a quote-unquote 
later a state of Palestine, uh, which finally has come into being. But at, at this time here, they were trying to, to create a state for the Jewish people to go home to. And the whole thing was the lawless of Israel. There were some renegade families like the Perez family, who was Shimon Perez, who actually went to a Jesuit school during his time in Poland, which was kind of an odd thing for a Jewish boy, don't you think, to be going to a Jesuit school? But these families that came into power would later be used to help to try to bring together to give the Vatican full uh, control of the land. It was kind of like a swap off, an agreement, so to speak. And we have seen people like uh, Shimon, uh, excuse me, uh, Shimon Perez, who in 1993-94, as it was stated by Barry Chamish, and, uh, and the former, um, there was another journalist there, my, skips, my mind goes blank on his name right now, uh, but actually exposed what the Vatican was doing and putting together to try to take over Jerusalem. And Shimon Perez then had promised to internationalize the city, give it over to a United Nations force, which is what they're really pushing for now, and that the Vatican would have full autonomy of Jerusalem. And we've actually watched nearly everything come to pass. And they're even calling now for a uh, international force for a United Nations force to come into the city. They've been talking about dividing it. Giulio Miotti in one of his articles on Israel National News has spoke about how that they will soon evict the Jews from Jerusalem in an op-ed there that he did there. Very interesting the things that are going on to say the very least. And then as I begin to study deeper into this, seeing that Israel, the lawless of Israel. Now, I'm not talking about the true Jewish people that are there to see the coming of the Messiah. There are many that are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. There are people like myself, Jews, that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, that he's already come, but we're waiting for him to return. We're also waiting for the coming of Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, and we're waiting for the coming of Moshe with him, who is no doubt one of the two witnesses. Moses and Elijah. We've done many. We actually have on our YouTube channel, those of you that would like to know, we have a section in there uh, about the two witnesses. I've done many teachings on this, very much in detail, so I encourage you to go and take a look at that. It'll be a blessing to you, no doubt. But now I want to take you over to the book of 2 Kings there. We established here, we know that Israel is being... Uh, basically, as, as I said the other day, uh, Shimon Perez, what did he do like his former father Ahab? He has married Jezebel, which is the Roman Catholic Church. Esau's descendants have been married into, uh, as far as this marriage covenant that they were bringing together. As Daniel states, it would be a marriage. They're, they're trying to marry the vision. What does it mean when it says marry the vision? You have to understand what it is, is the Catholic Church has always known that God would reestablish Israel. They would, once again, it would become an international city to where all the nations would come there and they would seek to worship the Lord their God. The Vatican wants to be the Savior. They want one of the popes that is there to be that Savior in a, in a, in a not so distant future. Whether or, not, whether or not the current pope we have now stays or goes makes no difference. Whoever is going to be there is going to be their man. He's going to be their man of peace, so to speak. And they're trying to make that vision come to pass. Now, I do believe, though, that God intended for the house of Judah to return home according to Zechariah's prophecy. So, so no matter how much of the lawless ones that got involved for the creation of the state of Israel, I do believe it was God's hand as well. God just only uses the enemy like he did with the Egyptians in the time when the Exodus, when Moses left, and he said to them to go and borrow of their neighbors all the gold and silver, and they did although they did use it for evil in the, in the wilderness journey and made a molten golden calf out there to worship instead. But nonetheless, it was still using something for a good purpose. And there are Jews there today fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy and many other prophecies in the Bible that the house of Judah would return in order for God to open their eyes and get them to recognize who their Messiah is, as we see in Zechariah chapter 12. Save time, we won't go there though. Anyway, because what I want to look at is what's happening in, in, in and around Israel today. If you go to the second book of Kings, 
And this is what I really wanted to share with you guys. It's fascinating, fascinating uh, passages here. In chapter 5, as we read the story of Naaman, Naaman, who was the warrior for Syria in his day, but he was also a leper. Now, if you go back to chapter 4 in 2 Kings, you find out this is where Elisha has come. Now, Elisha is a representation of the coming of Elijah as one of the two witnesses. Why? Because he is actually replacing uh, Elijah of his day. He is that one that the spirit of Elijah comes off of him, goes on to Elisha, and he carries on that ministry as Elijah goes up into a chariot of fire. And Elisha, he begins that great campaign. Now, when you look at it in chapter 4 of 2 Kings, we find a very interesting thing that happens there. We see two specific miracles that take place in Elisha's ministry. And one of those miracles happens to be the feeding of the multitude. And of course, the other one that preceded that was the raising of the dead, the widow woman. He promised her a son. God gave her a son. When the boy grew older, he died and he comes and lays his our, our breeze upon him, sneezes on him so uh, seven times, I believe it was, and the boy comes back to life. Doesn't it remind you of the story where Yeshua takes with Lazarus, his friends? And yet, while he's even dead, he says, I'll go raise him. And then Elijah feeds a multitude, and there's still food left over. Shows that it's the same God that was with Moses back there in the wilderness journey there, where God came and fed the children of Israel manna from heaven, the angels food. And then Yeshua did the same when he was on earth. What was, what was this all about? This was signs to us as Jews that we should have recognized that Yeshua was the Messiah because he was repeating everything that was happening back then. And that's what we have here in chapter 4 of 2 Kings. But then after that, we go into chapter 5. And it seems like in chapter 5, Elisha seems to represent the coming of Elijah. Because we find out that the king of Israel doesn't even, he doesn't even, it's Jeroboam, by the, or Jerome at the time, who was the king of Israel during that particular time period there, and he doesn't even seem to recognize that God has a prophet in his midst. Let's take a look at this. Nahum, I believe, there's two types that I can see Nahum as. One, he's actually a type of Vladimir Putin. Now, the reason I say that, if you notice, Nahum is stricken with leprosy. He's a good man at heart, but he's got a bad curse upon him as well. But it also, Nahum also types the church, who is strong and powerful. I'm not talking about the Catholic Church either, friends, not at all. I'm talking about the modern-day believers of Yeshua who are strong, who have, who have come down through the, the last 2,000 years as we even see in the book of Revelation where it speaks about the seven churches of Asia Minor, which represent in every age the different uh, forms of the churches of their day. There are some that are lukewarm like the Laodicean church age of today, but they were lukewarm back in the beginning as well. Every one of those churches are here today, and you find out that when Nahum dips in that river seven times, it represents just that. Let's take a look at some of the scriptures here. Verse 1 says, Now Nahum, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man and a valor, but he was a leper. And if it wasn't for... For uh, President Putin, friends, believe me, there would be, there would be no Syria as of right now. It would be totally wiped out already. Why? Because the West and NATO and their allies have been bent to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, which is a fulfillment of the book of Nahum. And we're going to go into that because you're going to see something I discovered. It threw me off the other day and I, I haven't brought a message out on it as of yet. And then the Lord shared with me some things today that really just set it into place there. All right, verse 2. And there are, uh, the, the, uh, and when you're looking on the screen here, the word uh, Aram is actually the word is Syria. It's the same thing. And Ar 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 Armeans, I'm actually reading from the KGV as I'm reading this, but just so you can follow along. I'll read it from there, but I'll use the word Syrians there because that's what it is in your KGV and many other interpretations as well. 
And, there, and the Syrians had gone out in bands and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she was waited on Nahum's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, then, would the, then he would recover him of his leprosy. Now see, what is it? In 2 Kings, it is, a, it is showing you when it's setting a time frame for you, friends, when God is going to send the two witnesses. Interesting. You may, that may be a shock to you there. Let me just show you there. This man right here, he's actually a signpost, like Nahum, even a professor that Yeshua is the Messiah. He claims Jesus Christ to be his own Messiah. He's not ashamed to tell you what he believes. Now, like I said, though, he's also a beautiful type of, of Naaman. Why? Because leprosy. Regardless of the profession that he has, regardless of what kind of valiant warrior he is, he's still, his, the, his faith is contaminated with leprosy. And we find out that how did, like for example, how did Miriam get struck with leprosy? How did Gehazi, Elisha's servant, get struck with leprosy? When they did something against the word of God, they went against the word of God. And in Miriam's case, she, she laughed at Moses, her and Aaron both. In the case of, of Gehazi, Elisha's servant, he went and did something in Elisha's name that Elisha never commanded him to do and then tried to keep it from Elisha. He was stricken by leprosy and all of his descendants. There's your church of today. She's cankered with leprosy, but God is willing to heal. All right, now let's take a look a little bit more here. All right, let me go back to it here for you guys so you can see this follow along right here with me. All right, and he went in and told his Lord saying, because um, she, first she tells, she tells his wife that there's a prophet in Samaria, Elisha. And he went in and told his Lord saying, thus, thus, and said, the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now, I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. You know who that was? It was Ben-Hadad. And Ben-Hadad, by the way, friends, was not, I mean, he, he fought against Israel, yes, but he was really not that bad of a king. Elisha actually, they, he sends word to Elisha. He believes, believes him. He believes Elisha to be the prophet of Israel. We'll go into that in just a moment. I don't want to lose thought here with you. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now when this letter is coming to you, unto you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel, Jerome, had read the letter, he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make, a, to make alive that this man do ascend unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? But consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh an occasion against me. It's funny. Now notice there's two things in here, friends. One, one, he sits there and he, he's, he's thinking that Hadad's got something against him, Ben Hadad, or, 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 or Naaman, the warrior, like Vladimir Putin. And he doesn't even recognize that Elijah is in the land. The king sends and says, I hear there's a prophet in the land, and he, don't, he doesn't recognize it. Even Putin visited Israel one time, I think it was before he was in power, Israel privately on a private tour there because he wanted to see the Christian sites. He had a heart to know what was there. I mean, I realize he's Russian Orthodox. I mean, it's, it's no more different than a Roman Catholic, really about the same thing. Maybe not as bad, but, you know, they pot can't call kettle black. But the point, like I said, remember, Naaman had leprosy. But he wants to get healed of the leprosy. 
Do you know that there's actually documentations that's been stated that Putin in his own custody has one of the old biblical manuscripts that was never included in the, in the Bible there and told the Pope of Rome that he would expose him? Imagine that, willing to expose the Pope of Rome. That takes some guts for a world leader to stand up like that and wonder why they're trying to kill the man. All right? Now, I'm not saying he's, he's no Messiah or nothing like that, and don't get that in there at all, all right? What I'm trying to show you, he's, he's in his heart, he's, I believe the man may have a good heart. See? But that leprosy is there. And Naaman also represents the church. See, the church has done great things. They've been great warriors. They've been out there trying to do good things in the name of the Lord, but they got leprosy. They're cankered up. Let's go back, friends. So he ran his clothes. And he's worried that he's worried that that that, that, that Naaman and, and, and Ben Hadad is, is out to get him. Israel's still doing the same thing today. And the thing is, it's also showing today that they're not going to rep recognize when, the, when God sends the two witnesses and they're in their midst, Israel's not going to, the leaders won't even get it at first. All right? So, verse 8, And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? In other words, why'd you tear your clothes? Let him come now to me, and, I'll, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Oh, brother, sister, you better need to wake up on that one. My gosh. Then he'll know there's a prophet in Israel. That's what's about to happen. And see, that's, a, that's there again. As I said, Naaman, it's, it's got different facets of revelation here. Naaman represents Vladimir Putin as a timepiece to show you that this is when your two witnesses are going to come. It's when that great warrior that's cankered is going to stand up for Syria. All right? But it also, Naaman represents the church that the prophet Elijah is going to say to Israel, send them on over. They take a hold of the skirt of him that's a Jew. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Isn't it interesting? He sends out a messenger to him, just like the church. The church is looking. Everybody's wanting to see the two witnesses. Oh, you'll see them all right. But you know, he sent out a messenger instead. Why? Because he was there dealing with Israel. And what did he do? What, what did he say? Go wash in the Jordan seven times. In other words, when the two witnesses come, they're going to tell you some simple things that you need to do to get cleansed of the leprosy that's all that the church is so cankered up with. And I can imagine the church is going to act the exact same way that Naaman did. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and recover the leper. That's the way, that's the way people are today. That's the way many Christians are. You know, they're expecting when the two witnesses get here, you know, come out here and <laughs> clap your hands and let's, get some, let's, let's throw some fire out and fire come out of your mouth and gobble up all the people over there. Praise the Lord, now we believe that you're the two witnesses. Maybe it ain't going to be that way. Maybe they might tell you that you need to go wash in the river seven times and that you need to get cleansed of your leprosy. Maybe they will be here to call out the sins of the church as well as to Israel to recognize her Messiah. Are not Amana and Farfa the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? That sounds a lot like the church too. Don't we already believe that Yeshua is the Messiah? Don't we got a little bit better? The Jews, that they've been blind all this time and you got your mind all on them? May I not wash in them and be clean? See, that's what the church is going to be doing too when the two witnesses are going to come. What do you mean? Tell me I got to dip over here in the river seven times and everything. Don't you know I've already been baptized? I've already believed that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior? But you got leprosy. Something's still not right. 
And his servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, Wash and be clean? What if they do come and tell you something simple that's lacking in the church? You know, many of the people, they want to go into rapture. What if they come and tell you, yes, he will, he will rapture you away, but there's some things you need to do to get cleansed up in order to go to his presence. To go in the presence of the king, you got to get some things cleaned up in your life. What if he says something like that? Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a present of thy servant, which can't buy the gift of God. Naaman meant well. He did mean well. He wanted to support the work that the prophet was doing, but he, he was all right. He had everything he had need of. Now, Gehazi, that's when he got leprosy. He went and chased the money instead. So the prophets out there that you got that are claiming to be one of the two witnesses that are just out there out there just for money only? No, sir, they're not. That's not that's not what God's looking for. You know, God knows it takes finances to support his work. That's true. But he'll help you with that. Right? Now, looky here. He said, now watch what he says though. This is Naaman, and he returned to the man of God and all of his company and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. What's the church is going to say? Now we know that there, the truth is here. All right? Now, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. Okay? Let's quickly hit it. Come on, friends. Let's, let's, go, let's, let's know what the truth is. We need to get the truth in. We got to get... We gotta get Tightened up now, friends, because it's going to get serious here soon. So we turn right here to Zechariah chapter 8, and we run down here to verse 23. Okay. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nation. See? Oh, my gosh. All right. All the languages and it shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That him is a representation of Elijah the prophet, a prophet to the nations, friends. All right? So this is where we're at here. Now, this is what I wanted to share with you about Nahum. Now, I want to show you something else that's going to blow you away here. The other day, I wanted to share with you some things from the book of Nahum. Sounds just like Naaman. In fact, a lot of times I keep calling Naaman Nahum. So forgive me. That's just a slip of the tongue. If I said it in the video, I don't even remember. But if I did, forgive me. I get the two mixed up in my brain there sometimes when I'm thinking there. Chapter 2, though, is where we want to go here. And this is, oh my gosh, friends. I was reading and studying this, and I've shared some of this on with you the other news the other day because we're looking at ISIS, we're looking at Nineveh, we're looking at Syria. And in Nineveh, it says right there that um, is of old like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away and stand and shall. I'm sorry, verse 8. Let me take you down. Let me get you right. I'll, let me do it here with you. Okay, I see what it is. It's actually, there's, it's one verse different here when you're using uh, the mamory.org. Um, Hebrew Bible. It's verse 9 there, but it's actually verse 8 for those that are using like King James or, or one of the Christian translations there, okay? But Nineveh hath been from of old like a pool of water, yet they flee away. Stand, stand, be, but none look, looketh back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is no end of the storehouse store rich with all precious vessels. She is empty and void and waste and heart melteth and the knees smite together and convulsions as in, as in uh, all loins and the faces of them all have gathered blackness. Where is the, the den of the lions, which was the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion and the lioness walked and the lions whelp and none made them afraid. Now, I mentioned to you because Nineveh, this whole region here, and I, I don't recall now, it seemed like to me that Nineveh was actually part 
of uh, Assyria. What well, it was, it was part of the Assyrian kingdom there at one time. Now it's part of the northwest corner of Iraq today. Uh, but when we look back at this Nineveh, modern day Mosul is where Nineveh is. This is the country uh, right now. And of course, Syria as well. Syria and, and western, uh, northwestern Iraq there is where the Syrian regimes are fighting. It's where Turkey is now in Mosul. And the prophets have already said, it's in multiple places in the Bible, at least two are anyway, where Nineveh will become totally without inhabited and never be inhabited again. And we're about to see these things come to pass. But he actually prophesies right here, take the spoil of the silver and gold out of Nineveh. And do you know that ISIS did exactly that? And not only did they do that, but even in here in Nahum, it speaks about that they would take the treasures and the gods and stuff out of Syria and take them into foreign lands. Well, I shared with you the other day here on Israeli News Live, I showed you how that they had taken 500 million or billion dollars worth of gold and silver out of the banks from Nineveh and Syria altogether. That's what ISIS did. And as well, they were looting all the treasures of Syria and Nineveh, and they were, being, they were showing up in some of the British uh, uh, auction houses in Britain. Amazing, isn't it? And they've gone all over the world since then. But this is what kind of threw me off when I was reading all this, and that was about the lions. Now, even going back to Naaman, let me go back to Naaman just a minute here. I wanted to share with you, I did a little bit of research on the names of the players that we have today. Naaman, in biblical times, Naaman's name meant pleasant, beautiful. Okay? Do you know that Vladimir Putin's last name actually, or his first name, means peace? All right, pleasant. Something that's pleasant is nice. Peace. Peace is something that is nice as well. All right. Now, his last name means uh, belong to the way. That's interesting, isn't it? He belongs to the way. And even though he is stricken with leprosy, he's still a professor that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So he belongs to the way. He's just stricken with leprosy. All right. And Naaman was pleasant. Now, neither one of their names, actually, neither one of their names had anything to do with being warriors, but they are both warriors as well. And they're both there to do what? To protect Syria. Putin's there to protect them in modern days, and in ancient days, it was Naaman protecting Syria. And another thing that was interesting as well is Bin Haddad, and uh, let's see, I got, I got them all down here. Bin Haddad, he was not a bad king, you know? And people might, they might disagree with that, but he was not. Even the prophet Elisha, when, when Ben-Hadad was dying, he sends for the prophet Elisha and wanted to know if he would recover the illness. His servant goes to Elisha to ask him this. And he says to him, go tell him, yes, he would recover, but he will die. And it didn't make sense to the servant. And then Elisha began to weep. He says, why, do, why dost thou weep? He says, you will kill him. And you will reign in his stead. And he did. He killed him. Now ben Haddad, did he do wars against Israel? Sure he did. But even Elisha, this is why even King Jer Jerome wanted to kill Elisha. He wanted to have his head cut off because of what was happening to Israel at that time. Now that, we're talking about ancient biblical. I'm not talking about modern days. We're talking about in the old days there. Syria had come up against Israel, but God was bringing judgment on Israel as well, and that's why it happened. All right? Now, Hadad, his name also meant thunder. In modern days, Assad, his family, Actually, Suleiman was what their, or Wahish was their original name, which meant wild beast. Their father changed it to Assad. And of course, he was Bashar al-Assad. Now, the funny thing about all of this right here, Bashar al-Assad, this is him there with his wife. He was educated in Britain as a doctor. He's really not, he, he's not the type of man to be a king of a country or president of a country. 
His own family saw that that was not the type of trade in him. He married a British girl over there. And as far as I know, he may even be a believer in Jesus in whatever kind of way they do. I mean, you have to understand, I, I, I don't like to beat up people in the different doctrines they have. I believe that God will send the two witnesses in order to straighten out the mess that people are in because you've got all these different denominations and they're all a mess. Ain't, none, ain't one better than the other. You know, some seem to be a little bit better. I mean, naturally, I mean, you know, Baptists are definitely got a whole lot better than what the Catholic Church does, that's for sure, you know, but they're all got their petty doctrines, all right? But Bashar al-Assad really is not a, as bad as what people are making him out to be. Even the part where they say that he used chemical weapons on his people, there's been enough evidence proven that ISIS did the chemical weapons. And we find out from what Russia discovered on there, not just Russia, the Turkish people's own, own man recently exposed that it was Turkey that sent the chemical weapons in there to use on, ISIS was to use it to be able to make it look like Bashar al-Assad did it, and he wasn't the one that did it. Now, his father, his father was not that good of a man though. He's the one that actually got into power there, and he's the one that actually set it up to where it was more of a dictatorship. That's what his, that's what his daddy did. And his daddy, Hafiz al-Assad, he, he died in the, in the year 2000, but he started years ago, and no doubt CIA and all that probably had a hand in getting the, this family into power and stuff like that. He tried to, to bring together as one big, huge Arabic region there, like it was in biblical times what he was trying to do. When he was at the point of death, um, he thought he might die, he looked to put his brother into, into his place. Uh, and his name was Riofat uh, Assad. But he was a corrupt man. He even tried to overthrow um, Hafatz when he, when, he got, when he overcame his illness, but they ended up, ended up exiling him. And then, of course, the next person that was in line was Basal Assad, which was uh, Bashar al-Assad's brother, but then he dies in a car wreck in 1994. And then Bashar al-Assad finally takes over, uh, even though he really wasn't ready to be uh, the dictator of the country, he ends up taking over. Now, I bring this all out for a reason, why? When you look here, let's go back. Let me just uh, share with you here real quick there. Um, take you back to the prophecy here. Verse 11. She is empty and void and waste. The country is. Not just Nineveh. If you, if you really look at all of Nam, it's dealing with Syria and Nineveh both. All right? It deals with both countries. And the heart melted, the knees smite together, and convulsions is all loins, and the faces of them all have gathered blackness. Because the country is just being just torn apart, especially right now in Nineveh and Mosul. Where is the den of lions? When Hafiz changed the family name to Assad, he changed their last name in Arabic. That means lions. So it says, where is the den of lions? In other words, where's the family of lions? Which was the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion and the lioness walked and the lions whelp and none made them afraid. Now, this could have many different applications here. But I see clearly the Assad regime. The father set it all up. The sons came along. He's married. He's got a lioness. See? The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps. Now he was, there, there came a, an uprising in the country when Hafiz was, was uh, first the dictator. And he, he put it down. He did a brutal put down of the rebellion. His father was that type of a, he was a dictator, no doubt for the greed of money. And it says here, the lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps. In other words, he killed a lot of men in order to make sure that his children would stay in power. And strangled for his lioness. Murdered people to make sure his wife stayed at a nice, fancy, luxurious country in all the best places. And, and filled his calves with prey and his den with raven. Then God says here, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots, and the smoke and the sword shall devour thy young lions. 
His son was killed in an auto accident. And will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messenger shall no more be heard. Even though Mr. Putin, President Putin of Russia, is there in Syria, and he's trying his best to keep President Bashar al-Assad in power, President Assad will end up being assassinated. Somewhere along the way, they're going to take him out. Because it says right here in the prophecy, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, his children. More prophecy is fulfilling each and every day. It's amazing to watch things unfold. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. By the way, let me just remind you, this whole thing is a, is a prophetic sign in front of your eyes. Remember, Naaman not Nahum, who the prophecy here, but Naaman typed the church and President Putin. And when you see him in there in the country there, this is the hour that Israel will end up receiving her two witnesses. But the nation of Israel, the government won't even realize. That, do you realize that that prophecy actually shows in 2 Kings chapter 5 that the that the leaders of Israel are not even going to recognize the fact that the two witnesses are there at the beginning? They will begin to really recognize it when they begin to heal the leprosy of the church itself. Like I said, Putin is only the, he's only the, the he's the pawn to show you the time frame because he represents the warrior part to show you the time frame where we're at. And then it picks up as the church itself the seven times dipping in the river, showing those seven churches in the book of Revelation that are here today, friends. They're here today as well. We better wake up. Pray. Seek God. Seek Him with all your heart while He may be found. We never know when our time will be up. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, another prophetic segment of our broadcast. Shalom. Good evening.